From Montana's news leader, this is the MTN 530 News. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us on your Monday. I'm Janelle Slade. Well, more than an inch of snow in one hour. Montana may have missed out on the huge winter storm, but our neighbors to the south most definitely did not. As more than two feet of snow that fell in parts of Colorado and Wyoming is still wreaking havoc for thousands of people trying to travel through. Well, more on the snow and stranded travelers in just a moment. But first, we head to downtown Billings, where a 24-year-old suspect is standing trial for the murder of a Laurel woman who died while committing an act of kindness. 57-year-old Lori Bray's body was found nude, strangled, and beaten on October 2nd, 2019, east of Laurel, just a few miles from where her car was located the day before. 22-year-old, 24-year-old Diego Hernandez is now facing what prosecutors call violent and brutal crimes that led to Bray's death. Q2 Shaquille Cozart takes us inside the courtroom. It was a shocking crime that shook the city of Laurel. Now more than a year after Diego Hernandez was charged with the murder of Lori Bray, his trial is held here at Yellowstone County District Court in Billings. The 24-year-old Hernandez pleaded not guilty to one count of deliberate homicide. Today, prosecutors began laying out their case against him. Bray, who was 57 at the time of her death, disappeared after leaving the Cedar Ridge Casino in October of 2019. Her car was found later near Buffalo Trail and Laurel Airport Road. Her nude body was discovered about three miles from there in a wooded area. She had been strangled. Prosecutors say Bray gave Hernandez a ride home after her shift ended and that she was never seen alive again. Among the first witnesses called today after opening statements were Bray's son, who began to suspect something was wrong when his mother wasn't home. Bray's former boss also took the stand. She reported that there was an incident where Bray was hiding from a man in, in the casino office. The trial is expected to last several days and will have coverage throughout the week. Reporting in Billings, I'm Shaquille Cozart with MTN News. All right, thanks so much, Shaq. And of course, court will continue tomorrow. A motorcyclist who died over the weekend after he slammed into the back of a car on Billings West End is now identified. 48-year-old John Altus from Billings died Saturday afternoon. Yellowstone County Coroner Cliff Mahoney says Althus died on of multiple blunt force injuries. Police say the motorcycle heading east ran into the back of a sedan waiting to turn left at Monad Road and South 38th Street West. Authorities say Althus slid several yards down Monad Road and later died at the hospital. The 90 year old driver of the sedan had blood drawn as part of the investigation, but police say there is no reason to believe he was under the influence of alcohol or drugs. In Lodge Grass, a shooting suspect is still on the run tonight after an officer involved shooting yesterday. The FBI says the adult male suspect allegedly shot the officer with the Bureau of Indian Affairs on Sunday morning and then fled the scene. No word on the suspect's condition. Now the officer's injuries are described as minor, the BIA is investigating. Well, if you fall into groups 1A through 1B, there are still COVID-19 vaccine appointments available this week. The Unified Health Command is still scheduling those appointments at Metro Park. Now you can schedule an appointment by going to mtreadyclinic.org or by calling 406-651-6596. Magic City pharmacies are also pitching in to get the vaccines out. Last Saturday, we told you that Farm 406 received about 1,300 first doses with a directive to get the shots in as many arms as possible. Well, there were no appointments necessary, and this weekend alone, the pharmacy gave initially 300 people those doses. There were just 100 doses left this morning, but those are long gone tonight. Staff say they are not sure when the next shipment will arrive. Every other pharmacy in the area is currently booked with first dose appointments. Well, as for COVID-19 case numbers, the state added 246 new cases in the last 24 hours, along with one death. That victim out of Dawson County brings the state's total deaths to 1,404. There are less than 100 Montanans hospitalized tonight and nearly 100,000 people have recovered from the virus. Well, air travel for people trying to get in and out of Denver was a nightmare this weekend after a massive snowstorm hits part of Colorado and Wyoming. About eight flights that normally go from Billings to Denver were canceled because of that storm. Now, flights from Denver to Billings started taking off at 2 p.m. this afternoon, and the flight schedule should return to normal by tomorrow. Kevin Plone, Director of Aviation and Transit at the Billings Airport, says officials got the word out quickly about the storm and he didn't hear of many people who were stranded in Billings over the weekend. 
A lot of people got out of town last week. Mm -hmm. Those trying to get back this weekend through Denver had some troubles and had to be diverted to else, other locations like Seattle or, or even Minneapolis and some of the other hubs that, that they could get through. So it was a little bit of a cluster trying to get back for some people, especially if they're going through Denver. But if they were going through the other markets, probably didn't have much trouble. We had some pretty good numbers over the weekend. Now, minus the recent storm, Plone says there are more and more travelers flying in 2021. This weekend was the first time in a year that staff has seen the long-term parking lot nearly full. Well, now turning to Q2 Chief Meteorologist Ed McIntosh. The storm is now winding down, but the after effects may just be beginning, won't they, Ed? That's right. We still have a lot of people as far as ground travel that are having problems. Here's a look around Casper uh, from some of the heavy snow from yesterday, and you can see how much it banked up around the, the cars and uh, things as uh, we look at traffic there. But the snow totals really were the heaviest once we got from Casper, Douglas, Wheatland, down to around Cheyenne, where we had over two feet of new snow and about two feet around Denver as well. So all those purple shaded areas, two to some cases, five feet of snow up into the mountains. Here in the short term, that's still gonna mean some additional snow, especially in central Wyoming. That's still causing travel on I-25 South from Buffalo down towards Casper. You get to Casper and I-25 is closed. Some areas of dense fog as well around the Denver areas. The sky clears and the potential for flooding. In fact, flash flooding could develop in areas where the ground was burned from wildfires in previous years. Take a closer look at our forecast and our chance of rain and snow coming up in a couple of minutes. All right, thanks so much, Ed. Well, Deb Holland is the new U.S. Secretary of the Interior. The Senate confirmed the New Mexico representative late this afternoon. The historic move will make her the first Native American cabinet secretary. She was confirmed by a 51 to 40 vote, despite some Republicans, including Senators Danes of Montana and Barrasso and Lummis of Wyoming, who expressed concern about her views on public land use and fossil fuels. She will now lead the agency that oversees natural resources, public land, and Indian Affairs. Holland will be part of Biden's plan to tackle climate change and reduce carbon emissions. Well, it's been less than a week since President Joe Biden signed the American Rescue Plan into law, and the details of what it means for Montana are still coming into focus. But one thing is clear. The Montana legislature has a huge new task before it to determine how and where to spend this flood of federal money in just a few short weeks. MTN Chief Political Reporter Mike Dennison as the latest on this developing story. The first thing to note is the sheer size of the federal aid at our disposal. Right now, we're up to what we estimate to be 2.7, over 2.7 billion, but there are several funding streams that we still don't know. So um, I would expect it would be larger than that. That amount alone is more than Montana's entire general fund budget for a single year. And that amount doesn't even include the federal aid going directly to some cities, Indian tribes, and individual Montanans, such as unemployment benefits. On Monday morning, three newly formed legislative budget panels began meeting to start drafting the lead bill that will direct how these monies are spent. It's almost like drawing up an entire new state budget, and they have only a few weeks to do it before the legislature wraps up in early May. It's going to take some effort to get all this aligned, and it's going to take a few tries. We won't get it perfect the first time. Much of the money must be spent on specific programs as outlined by federal law. COVID-19 vaccines, for example, or child care assistance, housing help, schools. But at least $900 million is part of something called state recovery funds, and those can be spent at the legislature's discretion. A budget director Almi says Governor Gianforte hopes this money can be spent on items that benefit Montana's economy for the long term, like workforce training, for those who've lost jobs due to COVID, or installing high-speed internet where it doesn't now exist in Montana. Senate Finance and Claims Committee Chair Ryan Osmondson believes lawmakers are pretty much on the same page in that regard. We want to be forward-thinking in how we use it, and, and we want it to be a, a huge boon to the state of Montana for years to come. That's the idea, and it's going to take a lot of time to get it right. The governor's budget director also says lawmakers may be flying blind a bit, deciding how to spend all this money without having yet seen the full federal guidelines. It's a huge job, and lawmakers have almost another half billion dollars from the federal COVID aid package passed in December that they must allocate as well. It's bound to be the dominant issue in these final weeks of the 2021 session. At the Capitol, Mike Dennison, MTN News. Thanks, Mike, and the MTN News team will report more details in the coming days and weeks on more specific elements of this funding and who they will benefit.
Well, members of the LGBTQ community and advocates packed the steps of the state capitol today, urging lawmakers to vote down bills they say will lead to more discrimination. However, supporters of the bills argue they are necessary to protect religious freedoms. MTN's John Riley reports. What do we want? At the rally, advocates pushed back against legislation that would require trans people to have surgery and obtain a court order to change their gender marker on their birth certificate, limit access to hormone treatment for trans youth, prevent trans youth from competing in high school sports programs, and Senate Bill 215, which would require a compelling governmental interest in order to prevent a person's expression of their religious beliefs. We're always on the defensive. Every two years, we have to show up here and, and fight for our humanity and try to explain to a bunch of suits why we're in fact people. Supporters of Senate Bill 215 say it won't lead to more discrimination and that the aim of the bill is to protect the rights of people of faith. So how far does this go? Does it allow child abuse or spousal abuse, beatings or blanket discrimination? No, all these things don't have a compelling, do have a compelling government interest to overrule your belief or your claim to a religious liberty there. 21 other states currently have similar religious freedom restoration laws, and there are examples of cases where those laws were cited in broad ways, such as a funeral home in Michigan firing a trans worker for not wearing a uniform that matched their biological gender on the ground of religious freedom. However, last year, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled against that funeral home. The people who are pushing these bills forward know very well that this will lead to open discrimination against people who face it every single day. By passing these bills, we will make Montana a place where LGBT plus people are no longer welcome and we have to defeat them because of that reason. Similar legislation was proposed before the state legislature back in 2015. That legislation did fail, although narrowly. Only time will tell where the votes will fall on these bills and if they'll make it to Governor Gene Forte's desk. Reporting in Helena, John Riley, MTN News. Thanks, John. Up next on tonight's MTN 530 News on Q2, a generous Montana community comes together to help raise money for those affected by a 7,000 acre fire. And in sports, we visit with a Forsyth wrestler now preparing to take on some of the biggest matches of his life.